Good morning, St. Andrew family, and welcome to our Sunday morning online worship service. I'm Justin Bullis, and it is my privilege to welcome you here today from my office at St. Andrew. I'm grateful, as always, to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. Please take a moment to visit gostandrew.com slash sign in to let us know that you're here and to share some information about yourself. We'd love to know from where or from when you're joining us, or if you have any prayer requests or questions about our church. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the work God is doing in and through the St. Andrew community, you can email us directly at connect at gostandrew.com. We would love to hear from you. Also, be sure to check out the announcement slides at the beginning and the end of this video to see some upcoming events and opportunities to get more involved in our community. You can also visit the events page on our website to see an updated events calendar. Lastly, if you would like to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can visit gostandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. As Reverend Mark reminds us every week, St. Andrew is an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. And now let's listen together as Reverend Amy brings us the latest sermon in our sermon series, I, James, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus, the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Hello, friends. And since we are friends, I feel the need to be honest with you. I don't really love the book of James. It's kind of preachy, direct, and a little too obvious. Okay, we get it, James. Be doers of the word, not just hearers. Follow that up with faith without works is dead and justification by works and not by faith alone. And it seems almost prescriptive. Now, you may have the illusion that diving into the text this week, exploring faith in action, is a sermon that would come easy. I assure you, like Waffle House hash browns, it's a sermon that has been served up a lot of different ways. But easy? No. In some congregations, this text comes in the form of a motivational sermon with a lot of shoulds in an attempt to get the congregation to move from the pews and the sanctuary into the community. In other congregations, this text is a fallback or back pocket sermon that pastors use on special Sundays like MLK Sunday or Labor Day, as if hearing about lives of faith with action is something that we pick up and put down depending on where we are in the liturgical or calendar year. But as I thought about this text and you, this congregation, 
honestly, I thought how faith and action isn't that hard of a sell here. To a congregation where putting your faith into action is a foundational part of how you are in ministry with one another in the world. Faith with action isn't something that I have to convince you of or even comes to you and finds you having a lot of resistance. So looking at this text, thinking of you, I found it to be challenging to offer something new to the equation. It's been said that those who dare to preach and teach James must be theologically disciplined. The interpretation is, after all, perhaps more than any other epistle or New Testament book, a text especially vulnerable to moralizing. A reminder about the context and what's going on behind the scenes here in the book of James. The seven letters of James reflect a challenge Christians faced in a time ruled by the Roman Empire. Early Christians were figuring out how to follow Jesus in a hostile environment where they regularly encountered slavery, class welfare, and conflicts. There was a real struggle at play between following Jesus in inward ways and making their faith visible when their faith put them at odds with those in authority. It should also be noted that historically there have been great theological rifts with the book of James as to whether a person is justified or saved by works or actions, which seem a contradiction to much of the New Testament, where the emphasis is on faith. I'm going to suggest that we save that discussion for another day. After all, Martin Luther and the leaders of the Protestant Reformation never came to an agreement. And it's the either-or thinking that often leads to moral superiority, which gets us nowhere. I spent a good deal of time this week sitting with the text, looking for a different commentary other than the ones that gush over the book of James and fall into the oversimplified trap of shrinking James into a list of do's and don'ts. And while there are powerful words woven throughout chapter 2 about our siblings, the poor, and the prostitute Rahab, which we'll also get to, I'd like to start today with a bit of self-disclosure. Not to center any of this on me, but rather to avoid moralizing others and by owning up to a struggle of living a life of faith in action. I'd like to think that if you polled the communities that I've been a part of, not just my family and friends, they would say to you, Amy is someone who puts her faith into action. You can count on her to step up, speak out, to stand with the marginalized. But that's only part of the story. One of my first appointments after seminary was to serve as the national organizer for the Methodist Federation for Social Action. Essentially, organizing others to put faith into action was my job. The Methodist Federation for Social Action was founded in 1907 to direct the church's attention to the suffering among the working class. The organization soon became Methodism's unofficial rallying point for the social gospel, challenging McCarthyism, and is the precursor to our denominational agency, the General Board of Church and Society. Now, when I worked at the Methodist Federation for Social Action, our staff had a budget line set aside each year for legal fees in case of arrest. Faith in action was the only job requirement. For the nearly eight years I served there, I was based in an office one block away from the U.S. Capitol, directly across from the Supreme Court. Walking to work from the Metro, I crossed paths with members of Congress. At nearly every march or rally that came to D.C., advocating for peace, equity, or people's rights, I was there, sometimes with other faith leaders, sometimes with secular groups who were working for the common good. It was my appointment on behalf of the United Methodist Church, my version of living a faith in action, or reaction, likely in the ways that Rev. Jerry described last week, deeply frustrated and angered by the injustices in the world. Faith in action was my job, in the seat of U.S. power, and yet it felt impossible to balance faith in action. 
I felt like an imposter, never getting it right. There was so much injustice at every turn, and I never felt enough that I could be enough or do enough. Throughout my life, I've had the privilege of walking with and learning from people for whom living a life of faith and action has been costly. And I have walked with and worked alongside of people that have become so attached to their identity as activists that their faith was lost in the mix, almost as an afterthought to action. I have friends that save their clerical collars for protest and are more comfortable at marches than in a sanctuary on Sunday morning. The faith action continuum is one that I've traveled throughout my life in ministry, moving in and out of spaces where it was easier to speak up as a person of faith and places where I was embarrassed as a person of faith when the Christian faith was used as a weapon. Rather than seeing faith in action in opposition, James invites us to consider a faith not at odds with action, but a life of faith in action, a life of service working on behalf of the most vulnerable, particularly the poor. When I was eight years old and my brother was four, you could find us most Saturday mornings sitting on our gold shag carpet in the front of the TV watching cartoons. One of my favorites in the sun in the Saturday morning line. Can I start? Sorry. Sure. Let's do <clears throat> uh, when I was eight years old. Yep. You want, you want a different camera angle, or are you just going to cut it? I'll cut it. Okay. When I was eight years old and my brother was four, you could find us most Saturday mornings sitting on a gold shag carpet in front of the TV watching cartoons. One of my favorites in the Saturday morning lineup was Schoolhouse Rock, which was really more of an attempt at education to a captive audience with a 70s beat sandwiched between the mindless marathon of Bugs Bunny, Super Friends, and Scooby-Doo. When thinking about the sermon today, I kept thinking about Schoolhouse Rock, particularly the episode Verb, that's what's happening, where a boy and his superhero idol, Mr. Verb, demonstrate the grammatically correct use of a verb. Now, I won't take the time to show you the episode, and I'll spare you from singing, but listen to the words. To be, to sing, to feel, to live, I put my heart in action. To run, to go, to get, to give, that's where I find satisfaction, yeah to search, to find, to have, to hold, to be bold. When I use my imagination, I think, I plot, I plan, I dream, turning in towards creation. I make, I write, I dance, I sing. When I'm feeling really active, I run, I ride, I swim, I fly. I get my thing in action. In being, in doing, in saying, a verb expresses action, being a state of being. A verb makes a statement. Yeah, a verb tells it like it is. I get my thing in action. To work, to play, to love, to live. That's what's happening. Friends, verbs express action in a state of being just like our actions are evidence of our faith. An essential piece of being and doing. How the boy in the video of Schoolhouse Rock is dreaming, playing, engaging, moving and serving. He is just happy to be alive, expressing himself and telling it like it is. In his book, Faith Works, Jim Wallace, a founding member of the Sojourner community wrote, when putting faith into action, faith has the capacity to bring people together, to motivate, to inspire, even across former dividing lines. We demonstrate our faith by putting it into practice and conversely, if we don't keep the power of our faith in our actions we undertake, our efforts can easily lead to burnout, bitterness, and despair. The call to action can preserve the authenticity of faith, while the power of faith can save the integrity of our actions. Faith that isn't practiced or put into action or lacks expression in being, doing, or saying isn't really faith at all. It's as dead as James describes in the letter to the early Christians. Now, I find the message version of the text today quite compelling. 
James sounds like this in that version. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, if you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and say, good morning friend, be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup, where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? Consider Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works and you get the same thing, a corpse. Friends, James' insistence that faith must be translated into practice makes good sense. And yet, how often we stop at thoughts and prayers. Sure, it's possible to talk about the love of God and neighbor, but ignore the one who is suffering from hunger, abuse, and violence. There is a lot of time and religious wrangling over words and being right, of who's in and who's out, who is more faithful, than consideration for who is most in need. So much time and money has been spent by the church fighting about who is welcome in the church and the rules over the best way to be the church instead of welcoming and being the church for all people. We shouldn't be surprised by the diminishing relevance of the church and society when it is actually us, Christians, who have forgotten that God is a verb. I am a verb. I am that I am, says God to the middle-aged Mac in the 2007 best-selling novel, The Shack, by William P. Young. Perplexed by this statement, Mac, who is having a crisis of faith while spending a weekend in his family's vacation home in the mountains, asks God to explain. God, who has taken the form of an older African-American woman, continues, I am a verb. I am alive, dynamic, ever active and moving. I am a being verb and my very essence is a verb. I am more attuned to verbs than nouns. Verbs such as confessing, repenting, living, loving, responding, growing, reaping, changing, sowing, running, dancing, singing, and on and on and on. Humans on the other hand have a neck for taking a verb that is alive and full of grace and turning it into a dead noun or principle that reeks of rules. Something growing and alive dies. Nouns exist because there is a created universe and a physical reality. But if the universe is only a mass of nouns, it's dead. Unless I am, there are no verbs. And verbs are what make the universe alive. I give you an ability to respond, and your response is to be free to love and serve in every situation. And therefore, each moment is different and unique and wonderful. Because I am your ability to respond, I have to be present in you. If I simply gave you a responsibility, I would not have to be with you at all. It would be now a task for you to perform, an obligation to be met, something to fail. God is a verb offering grace with responsibility, my friends. This is the crux of faith, the axis of the cross, the praxis of faith and action. James chapter 2 gives examples and elevates how our ancestor Abraham was justified when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. I'll be honest again here. This feels like a setup from James. It's tempting oh so tempting to get caught up in the doing, the acting out of our faith, that it feels like sacrifice is the only option. Thomas Merton, American Trappist monk, theologian, and social activist wrote, the frenzy of the activist destroys the fruitfulness of the work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, 
which makes the work in the witness fruitful. Merton wrote these words more than 60 years ago, but they are no less true today. Without accountability, especially with the communities that we seek to serve and be in solidarity with, and without attending to our interior lives that support faith in action, we run the risk of taking James's words to the extreme and becoming martyrs. This is where I want to quote one of my favorite movies, Sorted Lives, and say, friends, let's get down off the cross. Someone else needs the wood. Echo throughout the epistle, James is clarifying that action is an extension and evidence of faith, not a replacement for it. If I took a poll here today, I'm guessing that most of us would agree that faith without works is indeed dead. I wonder though, if we could be honest about how work without faith is exhausting. Living a life of faith and action isn't just about doing, it's also about being. I wonder how we as a community might also tend to our spiritual lives to supplement our outward and active faith. Whether it is through the Sisters Bible Study or Women's Theological or Spiritual Growth Groups, one of our men's covenant groups or Romeo, attending a Sunday morning class discussion, serving with our youth and mission or at after hours or in the greater community. I invite you to think with me how we can support one another in living out our faith with action, grounding ourselves, exploring the why behind our actions, articulating the theology that shapes our witness, not just focusing on the acts of mercy. St. Andrew, I continue to be inspired and grateful to be a part of this community. My sense is that you act with faith not because it's expected of you, that would be a task to perform, an obligation to be met, but rather you put your faith into action because you realize that God has given you the freedom and responsibility to love and to serve. Together, it is our collective and shared efforts that foster a unity between being, doing, and saying that keeps St. Andrew from turning into a corpse that James describes. In just a few weeks, we will gather on September 11th for our Come and See community event, discussing the opportunities and celebrating the ministries here at St. Andrew. I hope you'll plan to come and discern how you might share your passion and wisdom with a particular ministry, expanding our witness and widening God's love. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, Rev Amy, I'm not sure what I can contribute. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too busy, I'm too tired, overwhelmed with just the day-to-day task of living. I hear you. And one thing that this chapter in James makes clear is that anyone can serve, and there are lots of ways to serve. From making cookies, to welcoming a newcomer on Sunday morning, to taking sandwiches to folks in downtown Denver, or being in prayer for our educators. In reality, it is probably the most unlikely ones among us, the ones who feel the least prepared or assured of themselves that will have the most impact. I love the reference to Rahab and James. Here is a woman that so many have dismissed as having any value or anything to contribute. Rahab throughout the New Testament is known as a prostitute and an independent woman a betrayer and a hero, a Canaanite and an Israelite. Alongside all of that, she is also a person that proclaimed her faith, doing what she believed to be right despite complicated and terrifying circumstances. May each of us be so brave. I want to end today by saying that we are in good company and we have work to do. Historically, taking an active stance in society is nothing new for United Methodist. John Wesley himself sought to combine social holiness with personal devotion and piety. The people called United Methodist have been known as a denomination involved with people's lives, with political and social struggles, having local and international impact. It is even in our baptismal vows to resist evil injustice and oppression, wherever we may find them. Baptism is faith in action. 
there's a lot changing within our denomination, and some of it has to do with the church's witness in the world. I can't say that every United Methodist Church shares our values, but as we move into this unknown future in the church and in the world, I pray that it is our faith that drives our actions, that we stay out front that this church believes God's love is an active and engaged love, a love seeking justice and dignity where all are welcome, and we mean it, backing it up with our actions. Following the words of James, we cannot just be observers, but rather let it be known that we care enough about people's lives to risk interpreting God's love, to take a stand, to act, no matter how controversial or complex. May we be a church that invites questions and welcomes thinking alongside of action rather than prescriptions. And St. Andrew, when we are asked, may we be known as good neighbors, a place to connect where each one of us will be able to say in our own voice, unapologetically, that faith makes a difference here in us, in our community, and in our world. Just take a look at how and who we love. May it be so. Amen.
Hello St. Andrew. My name is Andy Abner and I'm the very proud principal of Rock Canyon High School. My family and I have been fortunate enough to be attending St. Andrew for the past couple years and we have found a home here. It is my honor today to come to you to thank our amazing educators. Our educators that go above and beyond, that consistently show great care and compassion for our students each and every day. Those that allow our students to believe in themselves more than they ever could, to chase down their dreams, to become what they want to become. Thank you for all your inspiration. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for everything you do for our students each and every day. And when I say educators, I mean everyone. Those that drive them to school, those that feed them at school, those that care for them at schools, those that are tying shoes and drying tears. Thank you all for everything that you do each and every day. We are proud of you and we're proud to have you in our community and we celebrate you. Dear teachers, school administrators and staff, Thank you for being heroes with none of the glory. You show up every day for all the students. You teach, support, administer, counsel, coach, assess, monitor, cook, clean, drive buses, and heroically use your gifts to provide a learning environment for all. Your job requires a lot of labor and love. Yep, you stay in the arena because you care so much. Your pay is not commensurate with the responsibility and stress, yet you stay in the arena because you care so much. New initiatives have been introduced every year. Public scrutiny comes in every form. Yet you stay in the arena because you care so much. We see the fruits of your labor and love every day. In the glimmering eyes of young people aiming toward their futures. And family grateful for a solid education for their children. And an all community vision of opportunities for all. We appreciate you and we are here for you. Blessings, St. Andrew. And now, as you return to the rhythms and routines of your busy lives this week, I leave you with this blessing from Reverend Gord on his blog, Worship Offerings. As people of faith, we have gathered for worship. As people of faith, we now return to the world. Go out to share the story of faith, the story of life with the world around you. We share the faith in word and in deed, in speech and in action. As you go out to give a living witness, as you go out to testify to God's love active in the world, go knowing that God goes with you, sharing the laughter and the hope, the fears and the tears. Thanks be to God. Amen.